Welcome back to the podcast. This is the Weeknight Mysteries podcast. My name is Yuras. And I'm Rain. Yeah, I'm here with Rain. As always. As always. We're doing great. Today we're going to be talking about the strange disappearance of three girls in Texas. This case is known as the Fourth Worth Missing Trio. Three girls went missing in the 70s from Fort Worth. Yep. Yeah, I actually never heard about this case, but it seems like it's a pretty famous case, at least in the Fort Worth area. Yeah, it seems like it's a big case locally. As, and it was a massive case back in the 70s. We have three girls, Rachel Trilla, who was 17, we have Renee Wilson, who was, I believe, 15. And we have Julie Ann Mosley, a nine-year-old. Three girls, and they all went missing on December 23rd, back in 1974. So, just two days before Christmas. I'm already assuming that since it's two days before Christmas, there were a lot of people doing their Christmas shopping at the mall. At the mall, yeah. And it's important to mention that they went missing from a mall. The three girls went Christmas shopping at the biggest mall at that time in Fort Worth. And they just never came back home. And it was a very strange case with strange, a strange letter being sent to one of the girl's husbands, Rachel was actually married because back in 74, it was a normal thing to be married at a very young age. Yeah, I also found it weird at first until you had to clarify it was normal back then. Yeah, I think it was pretty normal back then. It's a common thing to get married early. And yeah, they just went missing into 10, 10 years, essentially. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the details surrounding their uh, disappearance. So, I would like to start off from the perspective of Renee Wilson, because it's going to be easier to understand. Renee was the 14, 15 yeah. year old? 14, yeah, 14, sorry. I think I was uh, mistaken previously. She was 14 at the time of her uh, disappearance. So, if we're going to be talking about a little bit about Renee's morning. So, she was excited. And uh, she was staying at her grandmother's house in Fort Worth. And now this house was conveniently, uh, it was really conveniently across the street from her then boyfriend's Terry's house. And apparently Terry had woken her up that morning and given her a promise ring. So she was excited to show off that promise ring later on in the day on a Christmas party that they were supposed to attend to. And sometime later on in that morning, her friend, Rachel Trillica, who was 17, so she was like three years older than her, and she was already married, she called her, Renee, and she asked Renee if she wanted to go with her to do some Christmas shopping at the local mall. The mall was called the Seminary South Shopping Center. And it was apparently the biggest mall in Fort Worth mm -hmm. at the time. It's now called the La Grande Plaza. And right now... Oh, it's, so it's still a mall then? It's still a mall, but it's now like caters to the Mexican community or like, let's say, Hispanic community. Mm. Yeah, I'm looking at the picture and this was a massive mall. Yeah, it's a humongous mall. Mm -hmm. So, Renee agreed under one condition that uh, the two girls would be back before 4 p.m. because Renee wanted to have enough time to prepare for the Christmas party that she was going to attend with her boyfriend, Terry, who just gave her the promise ring. So, she so was, it was a massive thing, at least for those girls, because yeah. Renee had a ring, it was a Christmas party, so she's definitely going to show up. Show up, and she wants to show off the promise ring to her other like high school friends, like, mm -hmm. oh look, me and Terry, we're probably going to get married soon. 
because you know back in the day you probably already knew who you, you were going to get married with at like 15. I still find it weird because I remember when I was 15 all I was thinking about was like Harry Potter books. Man 15 what what type of life is that yeah thinking about marriage at 15. It's crazy right? Definitely wasn't thinking about marriage at 15. Different times. Yeah different times I guess. Now uh, what happened next is that uh, Renee also wanted Terry, the boyfriend who gave her the promise ring, she wanted him to also tag along with her to go to the mall. But Terry, apparently I heard like an interview, I think it was Terry, and this was years later on a podcast, he said that he didn't have any money at that point, I mean he was a 14 year old boy. So you don't have any money, you're just going to go to the mall, but you're not going to buy anything. So During a Christmas rush, I understand the appeal not to go. Yeah, me too. So Terry was like, no, I'm going to skip on this one. But instead, Terry's younger sister, Julie, overheard this conversation. And now Julie kept bugging her mom to let her go with the two older girls to go Christmas shopping. And Julie eventually was able to persuade her mother to allow her to do that. Now, the mother obviously regrets this, probably, for the rest of her life. You can imagine. Because Julie would never come back home that day. Now, the three girls set out and they drove to the mall. Now, before they went to the mall, actually, they went to the Army-Navy shop so that... One of the girls, I think it was, I think it was Rachel, so that she could pick up something from that store on layaway. So layaway is like a strange thing where you could kind of buy an item Mm -hmm. and pay installments. It's like taking a loan on a car, but you're taking a loan on like a jacket from Zara. As I understand, oh, it's kind of a weird, yeah, I've never seen it here, but maybe it's a thing back in America. Maybe it was like an old school thing. Because I can't imagine going to like an H&M and just buying a t-shirt on layaway. I'm going to pay you back. In like three months. In three months with like monthly installments of like two euros. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's weird, but I, I understand that's what was happening. After she picked up her items, then they all drove to the shopping mall, the big mall. Wait, so that Army-Navy store is a separate store from the mall? Yeah, as I understood, it was like a different location. Hmm. So then they drove to the mall. And this mall, once more, I want to reiterate, it was called... The Seminary South Shopping Center. It had a huge Sears store. What's a Sears? It's like a shop, like Like a... Like a clothing store? I have no idea. Everything store? It's probably like a Pepco. In Lithuania. Okay, I understand. Or something like that. And then it was a big store. It was like a three-story building. Do you think it's kind of like a Target? Yeah. Could be. Possibly, right? And so... They parked the car. We know they, they parked the car in the third floor parking of that mall. I think it was also connected to the Sears store, but I could be wrong on this one. And we know that they then went inside of the mall because there were eyewitnesses that saw the three girls at the mall. So that's what we know. Okay, so far, nothing out of the ordinary. Just three girls hanging about during a Christmas rush. Probably there's a lot of people. They managed to find a secure parking spot. Just going on about their day. Nothing weird so far. (coughs) Sorry for the coughing. Um, I think uh, also worth mentioning that the mall was probably packed. Most likely. So a lot of people... Yeah, potentially creeps also. Oh yeah, that's true. I mean, potentially, right? I can't remember the last time I was in a mall during those Christmas rush days. I think I was a kid and there were so many people. Like everywhere you look, people packed. 
and, lines and everywhere. And your experience is from Asia. Yeah. So 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 malls in Asia are like our malls, but like on steroids. Yeah. So it's even way worse. Way worse. So I remember going to a toy store buying buying some toys, some gifts for myself. With my mom, of course, and we had to stand in line for hours. Not hours, I'd say like one hour and ten minutes just to have that toy checked out. It was that bad. Terrible. But then but then I see kind of even crazier things. I see like huge lines at the McDonald's drive through Which True. I look at these people, I'm thinking, are you that hungry right now? I mean, they're probably not that hungry to stand in line for such a long period of time. They probably just want McDonald's that badly. That ba- how badly do you want that McD's? Badly. You know what I mean? Okay, uh, anyways, uh, let's go back to the story. So at around 4 p.m., you know, 4 p.m. came and went. And there were no signs of the girls. And uh, the parents started panicking. And by 5.30 p.m., the parents... They headed to the mall to try to find the girls because they apparently were now past the time when they were supposed to be back. Do you remember which hour was the Christmas party where Renee wanted to show there up? Was, there was no information about that, but Renee wanted to be back by 4 p.m. to start getting ready. Because mm-hmm. I can imagine them being late, possibly around 4.30. Probably was fine. The girls were probably just having fun. But... To miss that party, I feel like it's already like a red flag. It's a red flag. It means that something happened to them at the mall because mm-hmm. everyone had a plan to be back home. Exactly. No one was planning to like stay late in the mall. So something must have happened in the mall because let's remember that their car was found at the mall. So they were intercepted in that mall. Someone took them. They never drove up. Or lured them. Or maybe it was a friend of one of theirs who enticed them to go to his car. And we have some people that witnessed strange things regarding the girls at the mall. I'm going to bring this up in a little bit. But first, I want to kind of walk you through the parents' reaction to what was happening. So the parents arrive at the mall and they arrive and they were able to locate... Rachel's 72 Oldsmobile at the parking lot on the third floor. And there are mixed reports about this detail. Some sources claim that inside of the car, there were shopping bags from the mall. So that means they made it back to the car. That's one piece of the metal. Okay, so wait, going with this kind of uh, thinking, this no, line of thinking first. But, but but can I stop you here? Oh, yeah. It was, I think, proven not to be the case. Oh. So there were no items from the mall. That's what I'm saying. That it's like a misconception, I think. Because I was able to find one more credible source that said that there actually weren't any items from the mall. The only stuff that was in the car, I think, was from the previous... The Army-Navy. Army-Navy Army shop. Mm, makes sense now. Yeah, so there weren't any things at, uh, from like the mall in the car. Now, that indicates to us that the girls were somehow intercepted as they were in the mall, just they doing their shopping. They never got back to their car. Yeah, seems like they never made it back to the car. The very next day, a very strange thing happened. Rachel's husband, you know, Rachel was 17 and she was already married to a man named Tommy. You know, they just knew him as Tommy. So Tommy opened up his mailbox and he received a strange letter. It was addressed to Thomas A. Trilica, which was very weird because no one really called him Thomas A. Trilica. He was known as Tommy. Even if you would send him a letter, you'd probably say like to Tommy. So it was a strange thing that it was so formally addressed, almost as if someone who never met Tommy wrote this thing, right? And now the letter stated, I know I'm going to catch it, but we had to get away. We're going to Houston. See you in about a week. The car is in Sears Upper Lot. Love, Rachel. 
The letter was signed by Rachel, allegedly. No one can say for certain that Rachel was the one who wrote the letter. Over the years, handwritten handwriting experts, including the FBI, would analyze the letter several times, and each analysis came back inconclusive. The families in particular strongly feel that the letter was not written by Rachel, or that it had been written under duress, like as if someone forced Rachel to write it. For one, it was addressed to Thomas A. Trillica, the far more formal version of his more frequently used nickname Tommy. No one, especially Rachel, ever called him Thomas. Like, Rachel would never say Thomas, she would always say Tommy. Additionally, the family felt that Rachel was initially misspelled and then traced over with a correction. It appears that the final I in her name was ac originally a lowercase e. No, sorry, the, the final L in her name was a lowercase e that had been corrected into a taller I, or like L. I don't know what's happening there. Also note were these that- Oh yeah, I can see it. Yeah, we have the letter and we will be showing this on the YouTube channel. Yeah, there's a little loop. It's kind of like a Rachi, but it seems like it's been traced. It has been traced. I do see that thing. Rachel. Yeah, like looks like it, it was like two lowercase small e's yeah. and then someone like had to fix it but i think that's like nitpicking the, the the hell of it i think what what really indicates to me is this final detail is that one second is that the envelope had been started in a pen and finished in a pencil sorry oh, oh sorry so the letter has been written down in a pen using but, a pen yeah but then someone took that letter to the mail office and uh, already wrote it down with a with a pencil so it almost Wait, what? no so the idea is here that rachel is the one writing the letter mm -hmm. but the culprit already took her letter and went to the mail office and wrote over it with a pencil on the envelope oh two different why would you use two different i guess you know mm -hmm. interesting Despite <clears throat> the family's certainty that the letter was not from Rachel, the three families, they were actually waiting uh, for the three girls to return after a week. Don't worry about it, the police were already investigating on day one, but the family were still kind of hoping that maybe it was Rachel who wrote the letter. Honestly, going back to the content of the letter, I don't think it was Rachel. It could have been Rachel, but she could have written it under, I don't know, someone was looking, someone was threatening her to write it, because, okay, I understand the Thomas. Maybe she used the Tommy's full name, because it's like, you have to post it. Yeah, so Thomas was written, as I can see, on the envelope, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but the content of it... I know I'm going to catch it, but we just had to get away. Get away from where? Get away where? And it's Christmas. To, to Houston for a week. After They're going to go back after Christmas? Yeah, Julie. Julie, the nine-year-old, had to go to Houston for a week. No, it it's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. It's Plus, nonsense. Renee wanted to show off her ring in that Christmas party. I don't know, for teenagers back then, maybe times are different but i think it was a big deal and how would they go away without the car maybe Where? some other friends pick them up but or still like, it doesn't yeah. make sense or christmas like a train yeah a christmas is a big event and where where did they get the money <laughs> yeah so it seems like definitely it was someone who Either abducted forced them rachel yeah, it seemed like someone abducted the three girls and then forced Rachel to write the letter. But I'm trying to think about why would the culprit even go through this whole hassle? And we also have to think about the fact that the letter was probably written on the same day. Because it was, it arrived the next day. Yeah. 
it was written and posted on the same day. So the culprit abducted the girls, forced Rachel to write the letter, mailed it, and that in order for the letter to go the next day, I don't get it. No, I'm thinking, yeah, like that's a very good point. What I'm actually thinking about is why does the culprit even go through this? Because it fooled nobody. Definitely. It, it, it was obviously, I mean, it, it was never going to fool anyone. So what is the motivation for, for, for doing this by the culprit? By the kidnapper why why is the kidnapper writing this forcing rachel to write the letter maybe hmm. <coughs> i'm so sorry for the coffee they're still not fully well i see yeah Anyways, going back maybe the culprit didn't actually or wasn't entirely sure that his plan or her plan would work so the culprit probably forced Rachel to write that letter in order to throw off the attention. Yeah, obviously that's the main idea. Mm -hmm. But they still got away with it, though. But still. But who is this guy who's kidnapping these girls? Because at the same time, it's such a. It just seems like such an amateur tactic. Because I don't think that any like hardened criminals they would, would even bother to do that. Would even bother with this. Yeah, and then on just... top of that, you're potentially implicating yourself. You're like mm -hmm. you still have to. As I understand, maybe he just dropped it in like the post box. I don't think he had to go see someone. Oh yeah, that's true. But then it still seems like. It just still seems like something that will definitely get you nowhere. Definitely, yeah. Anyways, that but was strange. I do think it's someone who did not look suspicious, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. doesn't look... Maybe, maybe the girls even trusted that person. Maybe it's someone they knew. Or it could be someone who did not look like he or she is abducting the girls yeah because but then no no suspicions were raised i don't mall. think so i feel like i don't i don't agree with that because i don't think like the rachel would be like i think weirded out she wouldn't write this letter if she was just oh this is a person who's we're just playing a practical joke on my family no I, I don't agree with that one. I, I I just feel strongly that Rachel was forced into writing this letter. True, but at the same time, in a mall during a Christmas during the Christmas season, so many people were there, but no suspicions were raised. Like no one. Or oh, there will there there okay. will be some funny funny business like funny sightings allegedly of the girls. So yeah. Hold I'm gonna that. I'm gonna hold my horses. Yeah, for a little bit. Anyways, so the girls they don't come back home after a week, and uh, some time passes, and now we move a uh, one year into the future. Now it's 1975. Actually, not a year, just the spring of 75. So this is like maybe a few months into their disappearance. At that point, the family uh, was very well. All of the families were frustrated by a police investigation, and they hired a private investigator named John Swaim. So John Swaim was known for his charismatic persona. He was able to keep the spotlight on this case, and he ran down dozens of leads. This guy, John Swaim, he uh, started sorry stated that he had received an anonymous tip that the three girls remains could be found near port lavaca in texas so a hundred volunteers searched that boggy area but nothing was ever found so if you would look at the map i actually left a little kind of map screenshot here port lavaca is way down south in texas it's like, you know, on the ocean, basically. Yeah, you could see it. 
Yeah, so it's always very, very like far away from where the girls were were missing from. Mm-hmm. But the hundred volunteers searched, and nothing was found. John Maybe Swain, they were in a body of water. I don't know. We have no idea about that. About that tip. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it must have been something credible for, for uh, that John was able to convince a hundred people to go searching. No, I think at that point everyone's concerned. And well, it was so also like five years later. Five years later. Oh no, sorry, Just not five years later. A couple uh, of months. A couple of months. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right? A couple of months later. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's not. <laughs> I think it's easy to convince the community to participate if it's like very fresh. Yeah, but then again, it's far away. It's pretty far. You know, Texas is a big plot of land. Mm-hmm. How and many hours do you think? It- many hours. It's like a half a day travel, I think, across <laughs> Texas. So it was uh, strange because now this guy, let's remember John Swain, he died in 79 as a result of a drug overdose that was ruled a suicide. And when Renee's mother tried to collect pictures and some information about the case from John Swain, she learned that all of his records had been burned in what was apparently his last request. So this guy commits suicide and says, burn all of my records. That's weird. That's really weird. For what? What reason? I have no idea. Commercialization? He doesn't want anyone to uh, obtain those information? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it, I don't know if it was just the information about the the tree girls. The tree girls. Maybe it was. Maybe he committed suicide because of something else. Maybe he committed suicide because he uncovered something strange and like, or like, went too far on some private investigation. Possibly, and he wanted all of the all of the work stuff. Done. Burnt. Yeah, he just wanted nothing to do with it and felt depressed. I don't know why he killed himself. I wasn't able to find anything on this guy. Mm -hmm. So throughout the years, other leads had trickled in. And uh, early on in the case, a store clerk came forth stating that an elderly customer had approached her and told her that she had seen the three girls being forced into a yellow pickup truck. And this is happening within the mall. Like, this is a store clerk from the mall. Oh, so this customer was never found. So apparently some some elderly woman, as I understand, or an elderly customer, not necessarily a woman, told that, said that, sh- that, that they had seen the three girls being forced into a yellow van. Interesting. Yeah, and this woman was never, or this elderly person was never located afterwards. Do you find it suspicious that this elderly person was never found? No, not necessarily. Yeah, me too. Because I feel like elderly people, maybe maybe this person even passed away by the time right? police were searching for them. Or another line of thinking is maybe, you know, they just forgot were, about it. Forgot or weren't even like, or, couldn't couldn't bother going there again. Or the they didn't know. People or maybe were it was a very like small thing mm-hmm. for that person. You know, maybe she maybe maybe this elderly person just briefly mentioned this to the store clerk, and then the store clerk was maybe a younger person. And they were able to kind of make this into a bigger deal. Yeah, that's true. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And um, another witness claims that uh, he saw the girls sitting in a security patrol vehicle. Ooh, this interesting. Tip, yeah, this tip apparently ended up leading nowhere. How but come? Just no more information. Security patrol. So like the mall security? Yeah. Mm. The mall security. In 79, a psychic called from Hawaii and stated that the girl's remains could be found in an oil well. Apparently nothing came of that either. The police found in 76, so this is two years after the girl's disappearances, fragments of human bones, 
in Alvin, Texas, which is also on the other side of Texas, basically. And the results were inconclusive. Six years later, in 82, bigger pieces of bone fragments, including a lower leg bone, were found in that same location. And at that point, a massive investigation was launched of the area. The remains turned out to be those of three girls, but not the three girls who disappeared from Fort Worth. After this discovery, no more significant leads came forth and the case turned cold. And I was actually trying to find out who were the three yeah, other girls. What a coincidence. Who were found whose remains were found in Alvin, Texas in 82. And I was trying to I, I was kind of trying to Google 82. Uh, Alvin, Texas, remains of three girls, something like that, and I couldn't find anything. So I have no idea what's happening in Alvin, Texas in 82, but seems like there were remains of three other girls found there. Very weird coincidence. It's so weird. In 1995, Rusty Arnold, and Rusty was Rachel's youngest or like younger brother. Rachel. Rachel was the, the girl, the, seventeen-year-old. Yeah, right? the eldest girl okay. who was already married. So he, we actually even seen some interviews. He was a really nice person. Like you could um, listen to him on YouTube, and he seems like he's really trying to find his sister. He basically made contact with a new private investigator named Dan Jones, and Jones was familiar with the case, and he put up a $25,000 reward out of his own pocket for information leading to the arrest or conviction of the persons involved in the disappearances. He was never officially hired by the family because he was working for them pro bono out of his own interest in the case. As of 2001, he and Rusty believed that only Rachel was alive from the three missing girls and that Rachel was actually visiting the Fort Worth area every Christmas. And this was based on several credible witnesses who stated that they had seen Rachel in 1998 around Christmas time. So Rusty and the private investigator Jones have a theory but they were unwilling to discuss it publicly. They only said that it was someone close who was involved with their disappearance. Someone, someone close to the girls or one of the girls. That's what, very what do you think about What do you think about this? Yeah, That's very interesting. I could not picture Rachel visiting during Christmas time, but not really like making contact with the family. That's just pretty odd to me. Because what, what could be the reason if that was the case? Like, why is she visiting around Christmas time but not making herself known that she was there? This would mean that somehow Fort Worth during Christmas time is like a special place for Rachel and she just has to come back every year. But why not visit her brother? who is actively yeah. searching her family. Either she can't for some unexplainable reason. She has to stay. Someone is holding her captive. Like you're allowed to, but you're not allowed to make yourself known. Yeah. Something weird like that. Or I don't know. She's too embarrassed to come back. But then again, she didn't vanish. She just vanished when she went to the mall. Like, yeah. There's nothing there that would push her not to come back. And she was 17 mm -hmm. when she vanished. And at this point in 98, she would actually be 24 plus 17. That's like, that's like, wait, 24. Four plus seven, 30, 41, I believe. She, she would be like 41. And she would 
now maybe have a different life and she different just, perspective probably more mature more mature than now she doesn't want yeah she's older and now maybe has her own family and she, and she just kept this whole thing a secret for so long that she now doesn't this would almost even seem like Rachel knew what happened to the other girls yeah what happened to Julie the nine year old because maybe there's a line of thinking I'm obviously not saying that this is what happened but in this I'm just thinking the only way I could see this happening is that Rachel knew who killed Julie and Renee Renee and maybe they did go to Texas uh, sorry Houston Maybe she did go to Houston with someone, and maybe and maybe she she's now can't even co come out in public anymore because she would go to prison for the information that she has. Do you think there's a possibility that she wanted to run away from Tommy, her husband, back then? Because it doesn't seem like there was any records of them having fights or. Well, troublesome marriage well let's let's run a few of the details that i had for later right now mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of information here but apparently tommy who previously was engaged or was married with rachel's i think older, older sister? sister deborah that's crazy. That, but you know, it's the seventies, mm -hmm. so maybe. I wonder it, what happened. Yeah, obviously we don't know this information right now, but it's strange because Tommy was. So there's like some weird family dynamics. As on Rachel's side, there's definitely some strange family dynamics happening, and even to this day, as I understand, uh, Rusty, her older, uh, her younger brother. And Deborah, the older sister that was married to her then husband, at one point was engaged with her then husband Tommy. So Rusty and Deborah, they're not getting along because Rusty blames Deborah for being somehow involved in Rachel's disappearance. And Rusty thinks that Deborah knows more about the case. Now, Deborah came out. And she told the media that Rusty always blamed her for the disappearance of the of the girls, and that she has nothing to hide. But but Rusty still believes that Deborah had potentially something to do with her his older sister disappearance. Do you think it was just a love triangle gone wrong? There's always a chance, and I, I think that's something that could be considered. I think it's pretty crazy. Because there, there were two other girls involved. Yeah. Like, if it wasn't just Rachel. If it was only Rachel, then potentially... It was like collateral damage. A nine-year-old, really? Because of a love triangle? It's strange, yeah. I mean, how deep was this thing? Tommy mm -hmm. was just a regular kid, as I understand. Yeah, I, I somehow don't believe... It was the reason those three girls disappeared. I feel like there's something more sinister or something more. Me too. More. Me too. I don't think that... Uh, I never... Somehow I don't think that Deborah, the older sister, has like something to do with it. Yeah. There could have been a family feud or a hatred. But I don't think it's that much to... I don't know. Do something wrong. Something bad. Something terrible with three young girls it's just too much right so in 2001 the case was reopened and was assigned to a homicide detective named tom boucher but no new significant leads ever came from this reopening of the investigation however tom stated that he believes that the girls left with someone they trusted Additionally, he believes that more than one individual was involved in the abduction. While the police did not spe uh, speculate <clears throat> on whether 
they thought the girls were alive or dead, Tom revealed that detectives had written over 150 letters to coroners in a five-state area to inquire about any unidentified female remains found since 1974. And lastly, Tom claimed that the Fort Worth detectives had narrowed the number of suspects to under five. So we don't know who the suspects were. But we have something. We Apparently law enforcement, at least at one point in the early 2000s, they had under five suspects. Now, there's another guy named Bill Hutchins who made a witness statement that was also very credible. Uh, Bill Hutchins was a retired Fort Worth police officer who was working security at Sears on the day the girls disappeared. You know, the same shop where the girl's car was parked at. According to Bill Hutchins, he saw the three girls in the pickup truck of a young security guard laughing and appearing to be at ease. Bill Hutchins phoned this tip in when he heard about the girl's disappearance, but claims that the police never reached out for further information. Bill Hutchins just assumed that the case was probably solved, and he was actually shocked when the police finally reached out to him 25 years, 27 years later in 2001 to follow up on this tip. According to officials, this security guard was identified and interviewed, but denied having seen the girls on the day on December 74. Oh, that's pretty bad. It's pretty bad because law enforcement took 27 years to follow up on what seems to be a very credible tip. That's terrible. I feel like it was a different department already working on the case mm -hmm. and they just noticed a strange uh, witness report that was never followed up back in the 70s and they were like, oh man, I think the, the police force from the 70s dropped the ball mm -hmm. and now in the 2000s, you know, a new police guy was looking at the case and he was like, oh man, we have to call this guy. But and it, it's already too late. It, it already happened when uh, Tom opened up the case. So maybe Tom was the one who called him. Mm -hmm. You know, Detective Tom. Yeah, but you mentioned that the security guard, uh, the first one, the, where, the one that was hanging out with the girls, apparently, in the pickup truck. So there are two security guard sightings. Let's uh, get that out of the way. Mm -hmm. There's one security guard sighting. Well, there, there's this one from Bill Hutchins. Yeah, and the other one... I already forgot a little bit about the details from the other one. Let me... Isn't let me, it the pickup truck, yellow pickup truck? No, that's where the older customer... That's the elderly, okay. Yeah, there was another one. Um, I'm going to try to find... Uh, um, Yeah, another witness claimed he saw the girls sitting in a security patrol vehicle. So there was another witness stating mm. that they saw this uh, the girls in the security patrol vehicle, but we have no information about it, just that. And then we have a more detailed Bill Hutchins sighting of the girls being in the vehicle laughing and being at ease at the Sears parking lot. So we have two different uh, witnesses claiming that they had seen the girls with the security guard. And apparently the security guard, at least from Bill Hutchins' statements, were interviewed. was interviewed. Um, another problem with Bill Hutchins' um, citing is that, is that Bill Hutchins, I believe, if let me just check my... Uh, information here that I have written down for myself. So Bill Hutchins said that he had seen the girls with the in the security guard's car at 11.30 p.m., which kind of breaks the timeline a little bit because by 5.30, the family members were already at that parking lot. Yeah. So Bill's sighting kind of breaks the timeline. This would mean that the girls forcefully skipped out or like intentionally skipped out on coming back home 
like according to time, and then they were still having a great time laughing it up with the security guard at eleven thirty. Yeah, I just don't see how all of the three girls, especially like Renee, who really had to be somewhere, and Julie, and Ju Ju and Julie, and especially Renee because she had to like show off the the promise ring at the party. I just don't see how she would. I don't see them just skip, skipping out of, on everything, especially when we have a nine-year-old with you. What are you saying? You don't believe Bill Hutchins had a credible sighting? I mean, are we sure about the timeline? Maybe he saw them a little earlier, because that would be more credible than seeing them at 11.30. I only have information that he yeah. seen the girls at 11.30. I don't know. I don't know what to think about this one. What do you think? I don't believe that he saw the girls. Do you think he was just making up this story for some reason? No, I think he saw some other girls. Hmm. I don't think he saw the three girls. Do you think it was a security personnel who abducted the girls? Potentially. I think so. I think it could be someone who doesn't look suspicious. Or police always stated that they believed that it was someone close to the family. Yeah. Or close to them. Yeah, someone the girls trusted enough. To get into their car. Yeah, because the girls didn't make any commotion. We didn't hear any reports of commotion in the mall. A crowded mall, and if you feel threatened, it's very easy to just... Make it known. But it would have to be someone close to the girls and also someone who would force Rachel to write a fake letter. So that's something to think about. A close person, but also then forces Rachel to write a fake letter. I guess that's not that... I, I think I, it's I, easy to force someone to write yeah, a letter. I guess so. I guess that's true. So, we have three girls who went missing from a mall in Fort Worth in 74. And I think that they were intercepted in the mall by someone they knew. They didn't feel threatened enough, but they were abducted and kidnapped. I'm just a little bit hesitant about... The if it's either a security personnel, a police, or someone they trusted, because it could either be any one of those. Yeah, true. It could be any one of them. Right? Yeah. So, I think, uh, I don't know. Actually, I don't think we have that much. Well, I just looked at my notes. I don't have anything else to add to this one. Mm -hmm. I, I would just say that it's... Um, it's definitely not a runaway. No, yeah, it's definitely not a runaway. I think that um, it's someone who probably somehow was able to convince the girls to get into their car and then they, they were just abducted. Yeah, And true. there's no other information. I don't think that it was anything related to security guards necessarily. It could have been. Um, but maybe that first security guard witness... Maybe that was more credible. Mm -hmm. Then I don't think it's somehow related to Tommy, Deborah, Rachel, Love Triangle. Yeah. I don't think it has anything to do yeah, with their disappearance. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just thinking it's a kidnapping. It's a kidnapping of three young girls in Texas. Yeah, same here. I'm going with that line of thinking as well. Yeah. It's pretty unfortunate. Even more so about the fact that there are no CCTV footages at that time. That's true. Because malls in 74, they probably... Do you probably, think they had like CCTV I back have, then? I got no idea. I don't I don't. At least like one area? I don't know. Because you never see like CCTV footage from the 70s. Yeah, no. It, it, it's never a thing, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Question. Was there even phones back in the 70s? Yeah, there was phones, like landline phones. Like the brick phones. Brick phones, I'm, I even don't think they had any brick phones. I think it was just landline phones. No one had a phone on them. That's for sure. Or like almost no one, I would assume. Mm -hmm. 
it was rare. Unfortunate. Yeah. Guys, thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Now, please leave your comments. Yeah, let us know what you think. Maybe you got you have some ideas on what happened that we did not talk about. That would be great. That would be amazing. And we will catch you on the next episode. Thank you very much. And please stay safe out there. And we'll talk to you very soon. Bye. Bye.